In our series, The Great Exchange, we're looking at this idea that we give God everything we've done wrong and we give him everything we've done right. And God rescues us from our good deeds and our bad deeds. No longer do we find our identity in what we do right. No longer do we find our identity in what we do wrong. We give God our good and our bad works and he exchanges that by giving us his righteousness. He rewards us not just with heaven, not just with peace with God, not just with no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. But with the promise of heaven, a future reward for how we act. And that is how we move from seasonal faith based on circumstances to reasonable faith based on what he's done for us. The writer of Hebrews, we think is Paul, but we're not sure, is writing to a group of Jewish followers who are under severe persecution by the Romans. Machetes up to their neck. Swords and spears have taken away family members and they have to decide, will they continue to follow Jesus? And Paul's writing a letter to say, I want you to continue to stay strong under severe persecution and difficulty. We don't have to imagine that anymore since it's starting to happen in the news all the time where ISIS fighters are coming face to face with Coptic Christians in Egypt and other places and literally putting machetes up to your spouse, up to your child, up to your neck and saying, will you renounce Christ? So if you're going to write them a letter, these Christians standing before this kind of persecution, what do you say? What would you write down that would inspire or challenge Or give motivation to people to suffer for the cause of Christ, to die for the cause of Christ, or to be killed for the cause of Christ. How would that in any way feel reasonable? How in any way could you build a case for why that is the reasonable thing to do? That's what we're reading about in Hebrews 11. He's giving those folks and us as well the secrets to working out our faith, to making choices by faith. And yet he's going to address specifically in the chapter we look at today, the verses we look at today, faith extinguishers, things that extinguish our faith from being able to stand up for God and with God in regular circumstances, let alone this kind of hotbed of circumstance. Four uh, faith ex- extinguishers he's going to address. Number one, it's hard for us to be faithful or have faith when we don't know what's going to happen next. In fact, I think the unknown or not knowing is the biggest opportunity for us to choose fear over faith. The second thing that suppresses our faith that he's going to address in the passage is when circumstances haven't appeared yet, it's hard to trust. Now, what is faith? We learned last week that faith is confidence in God to reward us for the decisions we make now. Hebrews 11, 6. We know we're pleasing to God when we have put confidence in God that even though we haven't seen the circumstances yet, we trust God's promise is more real than my fear, more real than my circumstances, even more real than my feelings. The third thing that suppresses our faith is when we want it all now. I've got to have it all now in this life. And when you try and extract all meaning and purpose out of something in this life, It will ultimately fail you because there's not enough titles, there's not enough houses, there's not enough quarterly numbers that will ever satisfy the human soul. God placed eternity into our heart and only eternity can fill our hearts. So though we like nice things now, what the writer is going to say is until you realize your real treasures, your real identity, the real longings of your soul come in the next life. You're going to be really disappointed in this. It's a broken place with broken people who do broken things to you. And when you want it all now, it's hard to have faith that God may give you something later. And lastly, many of us live today saying, I want control. I'm going to control things like people and circumstances and time. And I don't want to give up control to God. So the reason I don't have faith in him is he may not control things the way I want. And therefore, we judge him unfaithful. We don't trust him. And into this, the writer of Hebrews is going to say, all four of these have a problem with delayed gratification. I want to know what's going to happen more than I want to know the God who wants to walk with me. Knowing becomes your idol. Circumstances not appearing yet. I want all the good stuff now. I don't want to trust you, God, and then you reveal the other pieces of the puzzle. 
God, I want it all now. I, I don't want to delay gratification to the next life. I want to get everything I can out of this life. And some of us are worshiping control. And we think we know better than God, the timing, the circumstances, because we can't imagine why a loving God would let this happen to us, to our daughter, to our son, to our business. And into all of this, God says the secret to life is delayed gratification. But the only way you're going to really delay gratification in this life is if you're gratified by something far greater in the future. Because there's good stuff and there's disappointing stuff and there's hard things and there's difficult things. And the only way to delay gratification now is to be gratified by something far greater in the future. A greater reward, a greater inheritance, a greater promise that will face the disappointment or the difficulty or even the good things you have now that don't satisfy your soul. He's going to give us four now and laters. Four things we can do now and four things we can inherit later. In hopes of giving us, and I hope it will motivate you the way this passage has motivated me, that there is a way to motivate yourself in difficult circumstances to say, even though life isn't giving me everything I want now, I can put my promise in what he offers later. The first now and later begins in verse 7. Our favorite phrase of the writer is, by faith, by confidence in God, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. So he's going to prepare by faith now. For things God tells him is going to happen later. And being motivated by faith, confidence in God, that God will reward him for what he's doing in the future and ultimately in heaven. He, moved by godly fear, prepared an ark. He prepared by faith an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world. The whole world gets condemned. Even though they're making fun of him probably and like, no, when's it going to rain? When's that worldwide flood coming? We don't know exactly how long it took, but he built that thing over decades, maybe up to a hundred years of his life. And you got to imagine coming home from work. Hey, Noah, is it rained yet? No, it hasn't rained yet. Your back, your hands, the wear and tear, the mockery, the oh, my aching back. And every one of those moments, you think, this is ridiculous. This isn't really going to happen. Did God really speak to me? And yet he continued to, as it says, prepare by faith for what God promised would happen. And oftentimes we don't know what the future is going to hold. We certainly don't know God's timing. It's not ready yet, not ready yet, not ready yet. And yet God says that when you're in that process, if you will prepare by faith, you can inherit by faith later. Because as he prepared by faith, he became an heir of the righteousness of God. An heir is somebody who has inheritance. He said, listen, I don't know when it's going to flood or if it's going to flood. God just says that I need to prepare this. Will I live for the the days when the flood comes? I'm not sure. But I'm going to prepare by faith. And by doing so, God says, I will give you my righteousness. I will make you righteous. And you're now an heir. You have the inheritance of the God of heaven. So even if I get mocked now, even if my back hurts now, even if it's difficult now, I have the promise that God's going to reward me in the future for the way I'm preparing by faith now. And he did this again according to faith. As a lot of folks over the years have thought, well, the ark is a nice analogy. It's a nice uh, literary concept. But let's not get too carried away like it really happened. It's not even physically possible to build an ark that big. The size of a football field? We happen to be living in a part of the country for the first time ever that they've actually built one out of wood that we can see. I got a chance to go down and see the ark about a week ago for Thanksgiving with my parents. Just amazing. I've read about it. I've studied it for years. But to see it, to be in it, to see how the wood planks might have been put together. I'd heard for years about a moon pool. And the moon pool is a section uh, in the ark that would allow the water to go up and down so you could drop excrement into it. And the water would go up and down inside the the, uh, ark and it would pump fresh air in to the ark. And you'd need some fresh air. If you go down to the ark, you get to see actually the windows, how the lights opened and how from the very top the light could pour into all four decks. How eight people might have been able to feed and water all these animals because of the system that's set up in place. I'd read about it, but oh, how amazing to see it. One of the major objections to the ark is the idea that you couldn't have fit all the species that we have today on the ark. Therefore, it must be a literary device. It can't have been true. And yet in the Bible, it actually describes a kind of specification of animals 
much like we might think of species, etc. The Bible calls it kinds. And so when they went to put the animals on the ark, Noah didn't need all of the dogs. German shepherds, which weren't invented, weren't bred until 1899. Didn't need all the wolves, didn't need all the coyotes. Instead, he needed one of the dog kind. God had put into the original dog all the genetic blueprints for all the dog kind. So he had one of the dog kind by which when they bred, we got all of the dogs we have today. Scientists who have studied this have found that if you take all of the different specification that we have, you could reduce it down to about five to 8,000 animal of kind that would produce the species we have today. And so Noah didn't need to have, you know, two million things on the ark. He had to have about five to 8,000, which would have fit very comfortably on the ark as he went through that process. Now, you might say, I'm still not sure if I believe in, in the ark. I know the Bible says it. <sighs> really? Here's what I go with. You can say the research and the science and archaeology on this is fantastic um, and lots of theories on the archaeology. But what's really amazing is I sort of go with, if I'm not sure about the Bible, I go with that guy who raised himself from the dead. Well, that's what I mean. It's just so simplistic. Jesus cites Noah as an actual historic event and says, just like in the days of Noah, when people were, were not prepared for the coming of the flood and they were caught off guard... So, too, in Matthew 24, I will come again and people will not think I'm really coming again. You got to be crazy. Really? Jesus is coming back to earth. Come on. You really, you really believe the literal Jesus? And in the same way that people weren't prepared in Noah's day, they won't be prepared in my day when I come to earth. They weren't prepared when he came for the first coming. Most people missed it. He says, but most people won't be prepared for the second coming. Just like Noah. So since Jesus came into history and he raised himself from the dead with evidence galore. I go with his view of the Old Testament and what happened with Noah. And what's amazing about Noah is over maybe a hundred years or so, he's building this thing, the aches, the pains, the mockery, and he says, I am willing to suffer now to inherit later. I'm willing to prepare now to inherit later. I read an interview with uh, Jim Caviezel, the guy who played Jesus in The Passion of the Christ. And he described... When the director, Mel Gibson, came up to him and said, would you, uh, would you like to play this part? He said, I'd love to. He said, by the way, um, my initials are J.C. and I'm 33 years old at the time. I think it kind of spooked out. Mel Gibson called him the next day and said, listen, I've changed my mind. I'm going to ruin your career. You'll never get hired again. You'll never get opportunities again. You will be so destroyed by taking this role. I don't want to be responsible for ruining your career. Jim said, you know, when I was a kid, I was 18, I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. I applied three times to the Navy training, and I got rejected all three times. I wanted to be part of something, willing to put my life on the line to die for something bigger than me. He said, you know, I realize I like my nice cars. I like my, the, the chance to be a movie star. I like the opportunities that I've had. I like the houses that I own. But if this is what God's calling me to do, and I feel like he is, I'm willing to give up all of that if I can be a message of Jesus to the world. He says, you know, all of us want the resurrection, but none of us want the suffering road of sorrow. I'm willing to take the suffering road of sorrow to bring attention to God. As he began to prepare for the, uh, the position, um, he felt like God was nudging him and saying, how much do you want people to see what I went through in this movie? And Jim said, well, I want them to see everything. He felt like God was saying, are you willing to drink my cup? He said, I'm willing, God. I want to make sure they see the most of you they can through me. During the scourging scene, when they had Jesus mount over like this with three cameras pointed and the scourge was coming down, the director called for them to get a little more animated, to come at it with a little bit more force. And the whip, though it looks like it hits him, it hits a piece of metal or stone they had next to him. Except because of a translation issue, while he was sitting there about to be scourged as Jesus, they missed the concrete block. And just the end of the whip struck a 14-inch gash down his back. He said he collapsed. He said, I think I actually saw God. He said, and then I realized that this one slash I got, Jesus endured for hours, showing his strength physically, spiritually, and emotionally. And I realized I was just getting a taste of what my Lord had suffered for me. He goes, by then I was starting to get so sick. I was 210 pounds and I was down to 160 during filming. 
I got pneumonia. My, my lungs were literally full of, of water in such a way that when I was on the cross, I was actually suffocating, which is how you die on the cross. You suffocate from not being able to push you up and get air. When you see the final scene, the final scene of the movie on the cross that they filmed, he said, my body looks blue and there's no makeup. That's how sick I was with pneumonia. They came to me as they were filming one of the final scenes, and every time they flipped me over on the cross, it actually literally pushed my left shoulder joint out of its socket. And because when I was on the cross, it would wave back and forth. My, my left shoulder would constantly go in and out of its socket. Incredible pain. The doctor came and put a stethoscope on me and turned to the director and said, his heart is doing so bad, he might die if we continue filming. The director came over to him and said, listen... You might die. We've got to stop filming. And Jim said, listen, if I die, it'll bring even more attention to this for Jesus. I'm willing to put my life on the line, not just for the Navy SEALs, but for Jesus in this moment. So they hoisted him back up for the final scene. Storms all around, not CG. He said, and he heard a dark, demonic voice say to him, you're going to die. To which he said he felt so sick. He's like, that was the best news I'd ever heard. <laughs> To be with Jesus and out of this pain and out of this misery. He got hoisted up on the cross. A third of the people were skeptics. A third of the people were followers of Jesus. A third of the people were sort of open to spirituality. And as he got hoisted up and they're just about to start filming, a third of them, he said, fell down on their knees. He goes, I saw a light flash. And what I didn't know, he said, because of so much pain, is I was actually physically struck by lightning on the cross. And everybody was like, oh my goodness, and fell to their knees. We finished filming the final scene, and I had to be rushed to the hospital, and they actually had to do heart surgery on me because of the damage I had gone through. He said, and what I realized is that all of us want resurrection, but few of us want to suffer. And suffering in your industry, suffering in, in adapting to a spouse, suffering with trying to engage with a prodigal son or daughter who just continues to reject your advances. God says, if you will prepare by faith now, you will inherit by faith later like Noah did. Maybe not in this life, but with a great inheritance in the next. Second, now and later. Once we prepare by faith, we must obey by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he called when he was was called to go out to a place that he would receive later as an inheritance. And you think, well, great. Whatever age he is, when God appears to him, he's going to live to be a couple hundred years old. He'll eventually get the land and the promise. But he actually won't get it here on earth. And yet he by faith obeyed. And it wasn't like a pure obedience. God said, don't take your family with you. First thing he does, it takes a lot with him. Don't be a person who lies all the time. He lies to the Pharaoh about his wife. So he's not like a perfect obedience. There's even a gracious obedience here that God says, if you will follow me, it won't be 100% right. But if you will, by faith, choose to obey me, I will work in the mix of your dysfunction. I'll work in the midst of what you do right and what you do wrong. So by faith, he obeyed when he was called to go to a place that he would receive later. And as he went out, here's him obeying, he went out, and here's the phrase I love, not knowing where he was going. But that's one of the reasons I don't have faith. I can have faith as long as I know what's going to happen. I'm not sure I have confidence in God and his plan when I don't have a plan. As a long-term planner, I find that often God challenges me to say, Chad, do you trust in me? Do you have confidence in me? Or do you have confidence in your plans? But God, you made me a planner. Yeah. But what if I don't tell you where you're going? I just say, you've got to stand up for what's right regardless of the circumstances. You've got to make this sacrifice regardless of how it works out. You need to forgive even if the other person doesn't reciprocate. I think one of the greatest things that keeps me from trusting God is the unknown. And it says Abraham is an example to us that he trusted God. He put his confidence in God. God's going to figure out the details. God's going to figure out the future. God has an inheritance for me. And even though he hasn't told me all the pieces, I'm going to trust not knowing what's in the future. Is there something in your life that if God told you what he was going to do, you would do it? But right now you're not doing it because he hasn't told you exactly what he's going to do? Follow the example of Abraham. Trust to forgive, trust to live, trust to give, trust to find your life by losing it, 
even if you don't know how it's going to work out. That's what Urban Meyer did many, many years ago in his career coaching for Ohio, and he was not eating even a meal a day because he was watching more film, watching more film. We've got to win, we've got to win. All the good pressure and all the, the good sense of responsibility being a coach. His wife was a psychologist, and he didn't really think much of the pseudoscience of psychology, but, you know, it's his wife, so he had to be sensitive. Honey, don't worry about it. She, she challenged him that he wasn't really connecting with God the way he, was, he said was important to him. She challenged him that he wasn't eating right and very healthy. He's like, listen, my industry is under so much pressure, so much pressure to win. I have got to be there hour after hour. There's always more game film to watch. And then he came to a moment that he felt like God was challenging him to obey by faith. Even though he didn't know how it would affect his coaching or affect his career, he knew God was telling him, I want you to obey me and treat your body like a temple of the Holy Spirit. Treat your wife as your primary ministry. And to stop trying to control all the outcomes as if you watching 15 more minutes of film can make sure you win. I want you to do your part, but I want you to trust me to control circumstances. I might lose my job. I might lose my edge. He decided not knowing what it would mean for his career, not knowing what it would mean for his life, that he was going to give himself a pink slip. He fired himself. He still has it framed on his door even now. And the promise of the pink slip is, God, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to have three meals a day. And treat my body the way you want me to. I'm going to go home at a certain time, even if there's more film to watch. And I'm going to prioritize my relationship with you by reading scripture daily. And we know how that worked out even in the last couple weeks. He could have lost his job. Instead, God got him a chance to have some inheritance now. He's healthier. His marriage is stronger. And this decision to obey when he did not know is still framed on the wall. A way of saying, I'm making God first. By faith, putting my confidence in him to take care of the future. So we prepare by faith. We obey by faith. How do you wait by faith? He's still talking about Abraham. He says, we need to wait by faith now. Delay gratification because we're so obsessed, so gratified by something greater in the future. By faith, the phrase again, he, Abraham, dwelt in a land of promise. He's living in the land God told him he would eventually have. But he's waiting. Like he waited for a son until he was over 100. He waited by faith. Not perfect faith. We've got an Esau in there. We've got a Hagar in there. Not perfect faith. But faith that though he lived in the very land that God promised him, he lived in it as if he was living in foreign country. Imagine going to your home. God said, this is my house. I'm going to give this house to you one day. But I want you to live in the backyard in the tent for a while. How long would you live in a tent in your backyard of a piece of property that God told you was going to be yours? I'd give God a week. What would you give him? Abraham gave him his entire life. Saying, if I live in a tent now, I know my ancestors will have an inheritance that I didn't get. And I know my ultimate inheritance is where? Look. He even dwelt in a tent in that land of promise with Isaac, his son, and Jacob, who were also heirs of this promise, with him of the same promise. For he, and here's what his secret, how did he wait? How did he stay in that tent that long? Because he was waiting for not just the city that was going to be in Jerusalem. He was waiting for the ultimate city that has foundations, whose real builder and maker is God. He said, this real land is actually a reminder of the ultimate land. This city I will one day live in is not the real city I'm looking forward to. I'm obsessed with, gratified by a far greater city, the New Jerusalem. I am gratified by, by wanting to be with God and have his ultimate treasures in heaven. And, and Abraham was very wealthy. It says he was very wealthy in the scriptures. He and Lot both. And yet, even with all his wealth and all his livestock and all his silver and all his gold, He was able to delay gratification of his land because he was gratified by something far greater, the new Jerusalem, the ultimate city of God. Did you know that there's only one piece of the promised land that he owned before he died? A grave. The only piece he bought was a piece of death to bury his wife. 
And I think the same way, we're not willing to own a piece of death, dying to self, dying to self-centeredness, dying to our, our needs, dying to having it all now. And God said that I will give you by faith if you wait for me now, and he does. There's a psychological experiment done years ago called the two marshmallow test. And they would bring children in and, and they would say, you can have one marshmallow now, but if you wait five minutes, ten minutes, depending on the experiment, we'll give you two marshmallows later. Most of the kids did what? I'll take one. Experiment over. The children that did make it were the ones that they said would envision the two marshmallows the whole time. Don't eat one. Just envision. Think about the two marshmallows. Think about the two marshmallows. Think about the two marshmallows. They might even find themselves sniffing it, maybe licking it. It was just a taste of what was to come. And God says, whether you're going through persecution or you've got a machete up to your neck, even if it's your son or daughter, and you have righteous indignation toward what's happening, the way you endure now is by focusing on what's to come later. The secret to delayed gratification is being gratified by something far greater. And that's what Noah did. The last example he gives here, our final now and later, is how do you rely on by faith now to inherit by faith later? By faith, and now we're talking about Sarah. I'll address her in the 10 o'clock service today. Sarah herself also received strength. She gets faith from God to receive strength. She's in her 90s, 97, 98, if I remember right, maybe 99. She's in her 90s. And instead of getting crabby and distant from God, she's going to find in her 90s becomes a catalyst to her faith. She becomes more of a lover in the back half of her life of God than even in the previous. Look what it says. By faith... Sarah received strength from God for her circumstances to conceive seed. Sarah heads down to Walmart. She grabs the cart. She's walking through the aisle. I'm 90 what? She grabs the pampers. She grabs the depend undergarments. He says, God, I need to receive strength. I'm going to be pregnant in 98. Help me. I'm going to be 100 and have a toddler. Strength, Lord, strength. I'm going to be 115 and have a teenager. Receive strength, Lord. And it goes on. It says that, and if you read the account, it doesn't start by faith. Your wife by next year will be pregnant. (laughs) She laughs. That's why they named their son Isaac, meaning laughter. And God says, why did you laugh? And he takes her phrase, which is something like, why shall I, who have have not had pleasure, who have grown old and weary, bear a child? God takes this in Hebrew. It's very filled with cynicism and disdain from a hard life, difficult life circumstances. Her status socially was down because you had high status by having children. Health declines, her body falling apart, her family gone, her dreams of a family gone. And in that circumstance, she laughs. And when God repeats her phrase to her, he extracts all of the poison and all the sardonic cynicism. He says, why did you laugh? Is is anything too difficult for the Lord? And God was so tender toward her cynicism and her doubt and her anger. She named her child laughter, but not cynical, sarcastic laughter. Joy-filled, hope-filled laughter. And I think that encounter with God was so powerful. In our terms, it might be that was probably the moment she really came to know Jesus or or know God, the Father. Because it transforms her that she's able to inherit by faith. And she was able to bore a child when she was past the age. Way past. Because she judged God faithful. Remember we said one of the faith suppressors is thinking, I can't control the future, and therefore God's unfaithful. He's not going to do what he said. When you put your trust in God to control things, you're saying, I'm trusting God to be faithful to do what he said, to provide what I need. And she does it by faith. And therefore, from one man, her husband, and him, as good as dead, thank you. As good as dead, it says in Romans 2, Abraham, as good as dead, conceived. And this is why self-sufficiency is such an idol in our community. 
It's our plans. It's our bodies. It's our talents. It's our skills. God wanted to show that when your body is as good as dead, when you can't depend on yourself, that's when I step in. And the phrase that Sarah uses, shall I have pleasure, in the Hebrew literally seems to imply that they have not been intimate in a very long time. So problem one. Two, she's got health issues herself. She can't imagine being pregnant. Three, Abraham's body's as good as dead. I'm not sure he's fertile either. But by faith, Abraham grabbed the walker. <laughs> Honey, meet you in the bedroom. <laughs> and by faith, from a man who is as good as dead, they were born as many as the stars of the sky in the multitude, innumerable as the sand in the seashore. And he, here we are this many years later, that through the Messiah, Gentiles and Jews came to know Jesus. And there were sons of Abraham that which you and I are. That God continues to bring those blessings. And yet he only owned and Sarah only owned a little plot of a burial spot, not seeing the full legacy of what God would do in and through them by faith. Are you relying, leaning into God into circumstances beyond your control? Relying by faith now means inheriting by faith later. I love this quote. The secret to delayed gratification is being gratified for something far greater. That's what Abraham did. That's what Enoch did. That's what Abel did. And we're going to go through verse after verse of all these examples of people who got this secret. But if you want everything now, you're going to be very, very disappointed in this life. Not because life's always so hard, because even when you get all your dreams accomplished, all of your goals met, you're going to say, huh, that's it, huh? Your heart has eternity and wants eternity to fill it. Not just as a, you know unconvinced person about God uses the Bible. As a Christian, your heart can, a spiritual hole cannot be filled with material objects. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis that supports that idea. It would seem that our Lord finds us our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum, but he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are too easily satisfied with people's acceptance, with careers, with important resumes and titles. All good things, not bad things. There's just a greater holiday in the next life. A greater inheritance. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews gives us our key takeaway. What does it mean for us this holiday season to live and give as pilgrims? He says, these all died. They all died, in, but they died in faith, not having received the promises. Well, that's kind of discouraging. Meaning they didn't receive it in this life. But they died in faith, having seen them from afar. There it is, my treasures in heaven. There it is, the promises of God for my ancestors. They were assured of them. They embraced them, though they didn't receive them in this life. And they confessed. And here was their secret. They confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. In other words, a pilgrim, an alien, or sojourner, for Peter uses all these kind of phrases as well, you realize this earth is not your home. It's nice. I appreciate the things of it. I want to take care of it because it's God's creation. But ultimately, I'm just passing on by. I'm a pilgrim. I'm heading to my real home. So while I'm here in this life, I want to be incredibly generous. I want to be a steward very, very well what God's entrusted me, my opportunities and my money. I'm a pilgrim. But ultimately, if I lose some money here or if I give lavishly, generously here, all I'm giving away is funny money. My real treasure is in a place that rust can't touch and moth can't get to. My treasure is in heaven, my inheritance. That motivates me to be incredibly, radically generous now toward the poor, toward the needy. To, to give toward Christ's bride, the church, to be part of educating people in the truth of where real, tre real treasures are, rather than building your life and where treasures aren't. And it motivates you to live differently. To say, you know what, I don't have to put the pressure on my marriage to get everything out of my marriage here. Because even the best marriage will disappoint you because it cannot fill eternity. 
And part of what's causing pressure in some of our marriages, pressure in some of our parenting, pressure in some of our business, the drive that we have, is we're trying to extract out of earthly things eternal values. When you find your value there, you start living like a pilgrim here. And you start being able to have a little bit more room. And your marriage can be great, but it doesn't become the source of your identity. You don't turn your spouse into God. You become very, very generous to other people. And here's what he says. For those of you who say such things, declare plainly that they seek a real homeland, not this earth. And truly, if they had called to mind the country from which they'd come out of, they would have an opportunity to return. We're going to come back to this earth in the new heavens and new earth. And now they desire a better and a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Are you living like a pilgrim? Or are you trying to get everything out of this life? Are you giving like a pilgrim? Or is your bank accounts your security? God says the secret to life is being gratified by something far greater. And the implications of that is you give differently and you live differently. As we live here on this foreign country called earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this challenge to us to live and give like pilgrims. Show us what it is, Father, for us to love you the way you loved us. Show us what it is to live each day by faith. Some of us here today, Father, feel like Sarah. We're too old. We're not useful to anyone anymore. And God, I ask that right now, by faith, you would give them strength. That they would receive strength this holiday season as they grieve the loss of maybe somebody who passed away in the last year. As they grieve the loss of a family that doesn't cooperate the way they want it to. Father, that you would allow them to, by faith, rely on you. Some people here, Father, are preparing by faith. And I ask that you would remind them that you have an inheritance for them as they love differently, as they live differently, as they give differently. And all this, Father, we look forward to the ultimate reunion with you in heaven and the ultimate city that is the new Jerusalem, that it may motivate us to love those before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being here today.